Hi everyone, today we're going to be talking about k-means clustering. So here are the famous five questions that we've been using throughout the course. We're going to be talking about what does k-means clustering do, what are the inputs, what are the outputs, how can we measure performance, and how can it fail. Alright, let's start with what does it do. So k-means works on an unlabeled data set. So this is our first example of unsupervised machine learning. Um, k-means is going to split a data set into k clusters, where each observation in k sub i is as similar to the others in that cluster as possible, and where the data in k sub i is as different as possible from the other clusters within the space k. Before we move on, I want to talk just, to, just real briefly about some terminology. Um, the idea is a centroid, and so what a centroid is, is it's the center point of one of these clusters that we're going to be finding in our data. So for example, if k were equal 5, we were finding 5 clusters in our data, we would have 5 centroids, or centers, um, one for each cluster. Let's talk just a little bit about how k-means works. Imagine the uh, blue circles in my data set here our data. They're um, data in two-dimensional space. So if we had k equals 2, we were going to find two clusters. What we would do is we would to cho choose two random points as cluster centroids and just put them anywhere. You can see here we've put them as the black dots here and here. All right. So then step two, what we'll do is we'll assign each data point to its closest centroid. You can see that we've done that here. Okay. So then step three, we're going to move the centroids to the uh, mean points of their assigned clusters. You can see that movement happens here. And then what we're going to do is we're going to repeat steps two and steps three until we have uh, reached convergence. And you can see here that as the centroid moves, each time we'll reassign all of the data points that are closest. And it could be that data points like this one here shift from belonging to this centroid to now this centroid. And ultimately what will happen is once the centroids stop moving, we'll have found converged clusters. OK, so what can you use k-means for? Um, the first thing, and most obvious, is you can use k-means to find groups of anything. So you could use it to find groups of customers based on what you know about them, or you could um, use it to find groups of customer complaints based on the text in their complaint or some structured data in their complaint. You could use it to find groups of questions, groups of phone calls. You could even use it to find lunch preferences amongst your friends. You name it. All right, so that's the clustering uh, use, or the common use of k-means. There's another really cool use, though, that I want to call out, and that's for finding anomalies. So in the most two obvious use cases are security and fraud. Um, in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to do clustering, just like we did um, above, but we're looking for something different in the data. Now we're looking for clusters that are very small and not like the norm. So imagine, if you will, um, clusters where you know you have one cluster and it's very large and it represents most activity on your website and then maybe you have a cluster that's very small and very unlike the others that cluster is probably one that you would want to look into that's a group of uh, uses that's very unlike the norm how come that's a question you can answer um, the other thing that you can do is that you can use this to find points that are um, very, very far away from any centroid. So this, is a, this would be a data point or an observation that's not like any other observation in your data set. These are both ways to sort of use k-means clustering to find the needle or needles in a haystack. All right, so what are the inputs to k-means clustering? Pretty simple, straightforward. Um, really, what we need is scaled numerical values. This is our old friend, the z-scaler or z-score. Um, you've seen this before. What are the outputs? Well, what you'll get out of a k-means model is you'll get a set of labels, one for each observation. So basically, a label saying, the, uh, telling you the group or cluster that each observation belongs to. And you'll also get a set of centroids, one for each cluster. All right, so how do you know that one clustering model is better or worse than another? Uh, this question really brings us to one of the trickiest parts of k-means, and that's how to find k. Actually, you know, so said simply, how many clusters really are there in your data? Because there could be any number. 
So there are many ways to determine an optimal number for k. Um, most are beyond the scope of what I can cover here. But I'm going to quickly cover two, and I'm going to hint at a third. OK, so option one. Uh, you walk into your client's um, meeting, and they say they want you to identify 10 groups of customer phone calls from your call center. OK, well, k is equal to 10. Maybe not, um, but the idea here is, is that if, you're, if your client has the ability to handle 10 categories or needs to know about 10 categories, you probably want to find a value pretty close to 10. Um, you know, maybe you, you try 10 and that doesn't look so good, and so you try 12 and you try 9 or 8, but what you don't probably want to do is come back with a million categories, because that might not be useful for them. All right, um, so option two is more about anomalies. And so let's say this time, let's imagine that you're looking at a firewall log and you want to find anomalies in, in your uh, traffic logs. Um, so in this case, k could be any value. You don't know how many groups of, um, or how many clusters you should have in this data. So your, but your choice of k is going to directly relate to your ability to find those small clusters, which are anomalies, and distance po distant points. Um, and so you really want to be very um, careful about your choice of k here. So one thing that you can do is you can iteratively, iteratively build models um, from k equals 1, or you, maybe you start at 10, it doesn't matter, um, all the way up to some stopping point number. Maybe that's 100, it could be a million. It just really depends on your use case and the dimensionality of your data. And so what you'll do is, for each model that you build, you're going to measure the average distortion. And so that's the uh, average distance, this is distortion, is the average distance for the entire data set from each point to its centroid. And what you can do is you can graph that, um, graph that uh, average distortion um, as the value of k increases. And my screen's cutting that off, here you can see it. Um, so what this is showing you is that as k increases, we have this like, distortion is rapidly falling and then it kind of evens out and then right here where this tipping point is we would call that an elbow this is probably going to be a good value for k admittedly this is more of an art than a science and i think um in the paper i recommend next it's actually called um statistical folklore all right, so option three. What you can do is you can uh, go out and find some paper, papers written by Robert Tibshirani and implement them. Um, Robert Tibshirani has done a lot of work in this space, and one of his favorite, or one of my favorite papers of his, is linked below. Okay, so how can k-means fail? Well, k-means is very subject to this idea of local minima which I think we've talked about in linear and logistic regression. This is slightly different. Um, but imagine you were to choose two random centroids uh, during initialization that were very close together. They just by random chance happen to be chosen very close together. What could happen is when you converge, you could have a couple of clusters that almost overlay each other, and then a couple of clusters that are very weak and loose because the centroids never get pulled over to them. Um, and so that would be an example of a local minima in k-means. One way that you could address that is just run k-means a bunch of times until you kind of converge and you get a, a result that's more or less the same over many, many runs. Um, there's another way that's a little bit better, and what you can do is you can implement some tricky sampling of your data to help you find better, safer starting points. Um, the most common implementation of that is called k-means++, which is the default for scikit-learn. Um, I've linked the paper that talks about k-means++ and its parallel uh, cousin uh, uh, below. All right, so that's a starting point for k-means and how it works. And uh, in the next video, I'm going to give you an example of how k-means works. Thanks.